it's our conviction to go through the Bible verse by verse through a book of the Bible. As you know, I'm taking some time to, if you've been here in the last few weeks, I'm taking some time. Before we start the book of 1 Corinthians, I wanted to take some time to look at some topical issues that are, I think are important. Things that we need to look at and, and go back to and remind ourselves of from Scripture. Things the Bible teaches on particular issues and particular subjects. And the one we're on right now is the Holy Spirit. What do we teach? What should we know about the Holy Spirit? Started this last week, continue this week, and, and in a future sermon I'll be doing it again as well. The Holy Spirit. I told you it's a study in extremes. In some circles of Christianity, it's hardly ever talked about. He's sort of the forgotten member of the Trinity. Folks, that's easy to do. Uh, we can be guilty of this sometimes in our church. We can, Galatians 3, we can begin in the Spirit and continue in the flesh. I, I, he got me saved, but I don't need him now in sanctification, self sanctification. Very easy to fall into. That'll be a subject in the future, but that's a real issue. It's easy in a church like ours, Bible church, that doctrinal precision, we, we really want to get our theology right and think right about God and, and the Word of God, and it's very easy to, to just not even acknowledge the Holy Spirit in some of these things. That's a danger that's a danger. And then you have other circles of Christianity where that's all they talk about is the Holy Spirit. And so you have extremes, and somewhere in there we must have the truth about how we as believers should think about this third person of the Trinity, this third person of the Trinity, meaning he is divine, meaning he is of the Godhead. You see, I told you last time that, that to take the Lord's name in vain it's not just about swear words. Taking the Lord's name in vain has to do with diminishing or emptying His glory. That's what van vanity is, emptiness, emptying something from His glory. It's certainly being irreverent, but it's more than that. It's thinking thoughts, and it's entertaining thoughts, and it's worshiping Him wrongly. And... We can do that so easily. It's the triune God, three-in-one God that we worship. When we come here, we sang about that this morning. Our triune God. We worship Him as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't want to misrepresent His attributes. We don't want to misrepresent His person or any of those things. We want to think rightly about Him. So that's important for us to know who he is and what he does. That's the outline. Who is he? What does he do? That's all. And we talked last week about who he is, and we said that he is divine. He is third person of the Trinity. He has all the attributes of deity. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. Where, where can I go from your spirit? The psalmist said. If I go to Sheol, you're there. If I go to the heavens, you're there. Deepest part of the sea, you're there. You're omnipresent. That's an attribute of God talking about the spirit of God being everywhere. He's all powerful. He's the creator. Only God can create. He is there in Genesis 1, verse 2. He's there. He's there. 2 Corinthians 3 says the Lord is spirit, full deity. He's not a force. He's not electricity. He's a person, personality. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve electricity. You, you can lie to the Holy Spirit, Ananias and Sapphira. There's personality. I can't explain three persons, one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons, only one God. And what does he do? Here's the number one thing he does. Job number one. We saw it in John 15, 26. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He will come and point you and me and others to Christ. 
he will testify about and talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. I said to you, a spirit-filled ministry will never focus on the spirit. A spirit-filled ministry will focus on Christ. Because he is the only way of salvation. We make much of Christ and the Spirit of God. That's his number one job, is to testify of the Son, to draw attention to the Son. Don't focus on the dove, focus on the cross. That is to be the focus of a Spirit-filled ministry. You don't have a Spirit-filled ministry, make much of Jesus. Make much of Jesus. I said also last week, one of the key things he does is he reveals God's words. He revealed God's words to the Old Testament we saw in Zechariah 7, 12, to the prophets. It said like this, the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his Spirit through the prophets. He reveals truth. Listen, he has given us truth. We live in a world of lies. And the spirit of truth has given us the truth of God. Listen, you want reality? You look to God for reality. You want the truth about you? You want the truth about origins? You want the truth about the end of the world? You want the truth about judgment? You want the truth about salvation and heaven and hell? The spirit of truth has given that to us in his word. This revealed word of God contains reality. Everybody is trying to create their own reality because they don't know what God says about what is real. 1 Peter 1.20 says, No scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, but men move by the Spirit of God. John 14.26, we saw last week, He will teach you all things, talking to the apostles, He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance the things I spoke to you. I can have confidence in the book that it's God-breathed because God superintended those prophets and those apostles in writing it. That is so important. That is so important. John 16 says, The Spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. The Spirit knows the mind of God. The Spirit has plunged into the depths of the mind of God. He knows the mind of God. And He has given revelation to those who He has used to record those words for us in the Scripture. So, so you, you say I'm connected to the Spirit of God. To be connected to the Spirit of God is to be connected to the Scripture because he's the, uh, He wrote it. He wrote it. And then I told you that we have to have the blinders removed from our eyes um, through illumination, that we have veil, and we don't, the noetic effect of sin has affected our understanding, and, and we need help. And one of the things the Spirit of God does is illuminates our minds as believers. He gives us the mind of Christ. We have, First John says, an anointing from God. We can recognize false teaching to help us in recognizing false teaching. One of the great proofs someone is a believer is they have a longing for the Scripture, a desire for the truth of God's Word. They have an appetite for something they never once had an appetite for before. They understand things they never understood before from the pages of Scripture. That's the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. You have the resident truth teacher in you. He lives in you. And and I will say this. It's not going to be apart from studying what it says. You can't just go to this book because people could abuse this illumination truth easily. They could just simply go to one verse and try to form some kind of teaching based on one verse. Keep in mind, it's, illumination is not apart from studying what it says. Illumination is not apart from looking at what it's saying in its context. Those who try to determine God's will by just opening it up blindly and pointing to a verse, and that's God's will, that is irresponsible. No, folks, we must recognize that God has given a context to his words, a historical context to his words. We must understand that, that 
there, the message, the overall message of the Bible is, is our, the redemption of man. We must understand elements of theology and, and other things in, in our growing understanding of God's word. We have to be very careful that if we come up with a new truth that nobody has ever heard of before, we might want to reconsider. Um, there are no new truths. They may be new to you and your understanding, new meanings that you had never se- meanings that you had never seen before. There are numerous ways to apply the Bible, but in terms of meaning, be very careful about coming up with some new meaning. That's how cults get started. But God does give us as believers illumination. And, and Psalm 119, I love the Psalm 119. The, the cry of the psalmist all through that psalm is crying for understanding. God, give me understanding. That should be our cry when we go to God's word. Help me to understand. Psalm 119, 18, 26, 27, 34, 73, 125. All those verses, the psalmist is crying out to God to give him understanding. I, I behold this book. It's your words, he says, and I desire to be in communion with you. Help me to understand your words. It's all tied together. Give me wisdom that I know may obey it and apply it and grasp it. Spurgeon said this, take care never to impute your vain imaginings of fancy to the Holy Spirit. That's true. You don't just attribute every imagination that you have about something to the Spirit of God, to the Scriptures. Handle them accurately to show yourself approved. I talked about those things last week. You need to go back and listen to some of those things. You need to understand this third person of the Trinity. And this morning, now, I just want to continue in that, and I want to talk about how he empowers us how he empowers individuals. And there'll be more detail on this in coming weeks, but let me just introduce this a little bit this morning. But Zechariah 4.6 says this, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. He's about to lead God's people from exile to rebuild the temple. And God says, it's not going to be by human might or human power. It's going to be by my power. And you can spread that truth in our lives. You can spread that truth in the church. It is his power that we rely on, not ourselves. He empowers weak and feeble people so that they can do things they would not be able to do. The apostles are great examples of that in the book of Acts. They had boldness and they had courage, all empowered by the Holy Spirit. When I have trouble and you have trouble uh, loving others, forgiving others, patient, need of patience, when I need to do something that my natural man does not want to do, the power I rely on is the power of the Holy Spirit to be obedient. I don't naturally just want to obey the Bible. I don't naturally just want to do the things God wants me to do. I, rely, I must rely on his power to help me walk in obedience. It's what, helps, it's what motivates a person to go on the mission field. It's, it's what helps you get up in the morning to read your Bible. It's his power, his prompting, his working in your life. What was it that kept Moses going when the people were grumbling? Numbers 11, it was God's Spirit. Joshua, choose Joshua, a man who has the Spirit of God. That's the kind of person God uses, one who has his Spirit. If you don't get it from education, you can go to seminary and you will not get power. You can go to seminary and you will not get the might he's talking about here. You can fill your mind with all kinds of information and knowledge. Education will not give you this power. This comes from the Holy Spirit. This comes from a depending on God and his spirit to work through in and through you. 
We're going to talk more about being filled with the Spirit, being controlled in the Spirit in the weeks to come. This is a big one. This is big. It's so easy as a Christian to walk in the flesh. And I think we know the difference. I think we see the frustration of walking in the flesh many times. Frustration in our efforts, the frustration in our joy. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Abide in me, for apart from me, you can do nothing. King Saul had the spirit, but he lost it. This is Old Testament language now. He lost it. The spirit was on him. He, he, he lost it. He went insane. Uh, he goes down his own path. Psalm sixteen fifteen. that spirit, that power is given to David. In Daniel chapter 4, even the pagans rep- recognized that Daniel had the Spirit of God or had some kind of spirit. They call it the Spirit of the gods. They got the number wrong, but they recognized that there was something different about Daniel because he had the Spirit. He stood out. There was something exceptional about him. And you can go through the Bible and you find God giving that power to people all over the place to do his will and to do his work. And that's what I say to you. We must recognize the importance of being empowered by this. We want to be a powerful people, spiritually empowered to do his work and to do his will. And there's one area that we might overlook in this and forget about sometimes, and that is the fact that Christ was empowered by the Spirit. And you may not think of it this way, but even Jesus, in his humanity, he laid aside. Him, Jesus, in his humanity, who had all the attributes of deity, he laid those aside to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting to, to read this. and He is the one, in, in his incarnation, it was the Holy Spirit who was upon him. It was the Holy Spirit who worked through him. At his birth and, and uh, at his uh, temptation, when he, faced, when he was ba- at his baptism, you saw the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all present. But the Spirit was upon him. Isaiah 11, my chosen one, my Spirit will be upon him. He laid aside in his humi- humiliation of coming into the world as a man, he laid aside his, those divine the use of those divine attributes and depended on the Spirit. That is an example to us that we need to depend on the Spirit. And I, I don't quite get it totally how all of this worked in the God-man. But we're told that over and over again that it's the Spirit who enabled Jesus to cast out demons. He says that in 1228. If I cast out a demon, I do it by the Spirit of God. Uh, he went into the wilderness to face, temptation, face the temptations of Satan. The Spirit led him there. Uh, we see Jesus operating that way under the power of the Holy Spirit. Hard to, hard to figure that out, exactly how that works together. But even the apostles recognize that. You know, 1038 of Acts says it this way, and you know of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth, that's his, in his humanity, a man. You know how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. So, so Jesus was empowered by the Spirit. The Spirit worked in and through him. He resisted temptation in the power of the Spirit. He faced challenges in the power of the Spirit. When it says when he was discouraged at one point in Luke chapter 10, it says he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. It was the sustaining power of the Holy Spirit that was working in Jesus' life in his humanity. Very important as he understood what we go through, Hebrews says, and he had to depend on the Spirit of God like we're called to depend on the Spirit of God. In Hebrews chapter 9, it's even to the point of the cross that he, by the eternal Spirit of God, he gave his life as a sacrifice. So his whole life was characterized by a dependency and the working of the Holy Spirit. Even in, e- even in Romans, where it says that the resurrection was by the Spirit of God. So his whole life was one that was controlled by the, the Spirit of God. In his incarnation, there was that dependency. 
I want to address something this morning that might be confusing to you in the ministry of Christ. Um, in Matt, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. And this is where Jesus talks about the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And this may come up in your mind. Sometimes people get plagued with this because Jesus says that you won't be forgiven for this sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I used the terminology last week, and I may have confused you in the way I used it, and I want to clarify that. Because what I said to you last week, there are many today who are attributing, the, I believe, the works of Satan to the Holy Spirit. I believe there are some people today who are saying God did something when really I believe the devil did it. Um, just some of the things that people do. I went through some examples last week. I won't go into all that. But the point is, I may have, mis I may have left some confusion in your mind about this. And I want to clarify it. Because when you think blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, you're brought to this passage in Je Matthew chapter 12, and it says there's no forgiveness for a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. But I want you to understand something about the word blasphemy means to speak against or to do something against. Um, I would just say to you that that sin was committed by the Apostle Paul and he was forgiven. That sin was committed by most of you before you came to Christ and you've been forgiven. So whatever this means, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's something going on here in Matthew chapter 12 that might be a little bit different than that. I certainly did not mean that in my words last week, that an unpardonable sin is being committed by people who are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So what, do I, what, what does it mean? That's, get to the point, Rod, get to the point. Let's, let's look at this. Um, he says, and there's a sin that, there's no forgiveness for. We see that. Matthew, let's start in verse 22. Jesus has a multitude of people around him. Jesus has a multitude of people that uh, have been watching, listening to him preach. They've been listening to him, um, uh, watching him do miracles. They've been watching all kinds, they've been seeing all kinds of things. And a demon-possessed man, verse 22, I referred to this earlier, who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. Then go down to verse 28, Jesus says, it's the Holy Spirit that enabled me to do that. That's what I've been talking about earlier. The Holy Spirit enabled him to do that. And then verse 20, back up to verse 23, all the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? In other words, is this man the Messiah? Is this man the Messiah? But the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Israel, interject at that point, and they say, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. And so what they're saying at that point is, no, this man is not doing a work of God. This man is not the Messiah. What this man is doing is of the devil. They saw a demonstration of the Spirit of God, and they concluded, no, it's not of God, it's of the devil. Okay? That's the scene here. And then, in the same passage, Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees still, says to them, after he, give, after he gives some illustrations of why, what they, why it's absurd what they have said, then he gets, says this in verse 31, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. So there's been confusion. What is this unpardonable sin? Some people would say, if you, if you question a charismatic gift, 
of healing or you have doubts about any charismatic gift, they would say you're committing the unpardonable sin. Keep in mind, this is Matthew. Gifts don't even happen until Acts. So that hasn't even happened yet. That's not a valid response to this. That's not the unpardonable sin. Some people get real scared and they say, well, maybe it's uh, uh, something I've done. Maybe it's a lie I've told. Maybe it's something I've done that um, has caused this. And some people get real upset and wonder, have I committed this unpardonable sin? So this is a very, um, very real issue. People thinking they have crossed some forbidden line. Pharisees and the religious leaders in this context have cursed God. Understand that. They had cursed God. Now, God through Christ is cursing them. That's what's going on here. They've cursed God, the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, and now God is cursing them. And they have committed a sin that is unforgivable. Um, Speaking evil against God. Saying something about God that is not true. That's blasphemy. Uh, blasphemy, but as I said before, is a sin that can be forgiven. Blasphemy against God is a sin that can be forgiven. But we're speaking here, I believe, about something in a context. Something in, in a context here. He says, you can speak against the Son of Man. See that in verse 32? That's, you can speak against me in my humanity. You can look at me and conclude that I may not be deity, but you cannot deny that the Holy Spirit is deity. And you cannot deny that these healings that you've seen, and keep in mind, it's not just a, a, a demon-possessed man. It's, it's an accumulation of miracles that they have seen. It's accumulation of revelation that they have seen. These religious leaders have seen all kinds of power demonstrated by the Holy Spirit working through Jesus. You can look at me as the son of man, he's saying, and you can speak against me because maybe you don't perceive me as deity, but you cannot deny, you cannot speak against the Holy Spirit and deny his power and his deity is at work here. I recognize that you, what you're saying is I recognize the supernatural, I see it, but I think it's hell and not heaven. That's what they're saying. For, for them, that will not be forgiven. You conclude it's of the devil. You conclude that it's of the devil. You cannot be forgiven because you will not. You can't be, you will not be forgiven because you can't be forgiven because you don't want to be forgiven. Because you don't believe I can forgive. You're speaking, so, so the issue is that they believe he is of the devil They're not going to listen to any message about repentance and faith. You see, repentance and faith is what saved Paul and saves others from their blasphemy. Paul says, I was a blasphemer. What saved Paul was repentance and faith. These people, he's saying, basically, you're never going to believe. You're never going to believe. Here's it. Here's the th- it's a unique situation. It's a very unique situation. They have seen incredible evidence. They've been given all this evidence, and their conclusion is the opposite of truth. So in the face of truth, they will not be believe. They, therefore, they will not be forgiven. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. In the face of all the evidence, you conclude that it's of the devil, and you say, and because of that, you will not believe, and therefore, you will never be forgiven. You will never get to a forgiveness condition, which is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, because you've concluded the very opposite. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm of the devil. Therefore, forgiveness is not going to happen for you. 
because you are unwilling to do that. It's obvious you will never come to me. Therefore, you will never be forgiven. I believe this is in this context. I believe this is in a time when Jesus was present on the earth. I believe this is in a time when the Holy Spirit was working through Jesus mightily and there were numerous miracles taking place in his ministry and the accumulation of all of that evidence was so overwhelming. And they saw all of that. They knew he had power, but they concluded the opposite about him. And they blasphemed the Holy Spirit. They spoke against the Holy Spirit. He's, this is of the devil, not the Holy Spirit. It's because of what they concluded. They would not experience forgiveness. You will never get to that forgiveness condition because of that mindset. Attributing to Satan the works of the Spirit. God did it, but they say Satan did it. All the revelation was there, and they concluded it was satanic. Therefore, they can never be forgiven. That's what he's saying. If you're a Christian, don't worry about this verse. If you're a Christian, don't worry about this verse. There's no way. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can never commit an unforgivable sin as a Christian. You understand that? You cannot. And I would even say to an unbeliever, I would say there is a principle here. There is a principle here. There is no sin for which God will not forgive you. He co- you know, the only sin he didn't die for on the cross was unbelief. But he... he died for you. I don't care how bad you think you are. He died for every sin you could possibly commit. But there is a time when he will strive with you no more. I believe that. I believe that the more revelation that piles up and the more sermons that you hear and the more Christians that talk to you and the more information that you gather, if your heart just continues to get harder and harder and harder and harder, I believe you won't believe. I believe you won't be able to believe. You have hardened your heart so much. I think that's a principle there. It's best not to hear a sermon if you're not going to ever believe. Because the continual resistance just hardens your heart even more to where you won't believe, you can't believe because of the hardness of your heart. So I think there is a principle there. And so that's why you need to heed Jesus' words when he says, believe while it is day for the night comes when the lights are going to go out. And he will say to you, go thine own way. Go thine own way. He will just give you over. So there is a principle. I think that's a principle very much like this principle in the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. A little different. Context is different. I think it's a unique context to these Pharisees who were so hardened and eventually, and he pronounced this judgment on them. So, let me, let, me t- let me get a little more personal with the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I got several of these, but I'm just going to look at one, then we're going to stop this morning. But I want you to see this. But I hope that clears up that issue. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I think people do blasphemy of the Holy Spirit all the time. I do think people say and attribute things to him that are not true. I think they're unbiblical things that are said about him. That's blasphemy. I don't think that's the same as Matthew 12. Let me me talk about this a little more personal to you now, and me. What does the Holy Spirit do? What what did he do in, in saving me? Let's talk about that. Four things, I'm just going to cover one of them. The first one he does is he convicts you. He convicts. That is his, that's his role. Notice these words, uh, I think it's in, later in John 16, 7, 
he will convict the world concerning sin. I'll go, I'm going to turn to that verse in just a minute. But let me, let me give you an example here in Acts chapter 7. Stephen is preaching. In Acts 7, 51, Stephen is preaching. And he says, you men, he's, he's just gone through the whole Old Testament. And he says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You know, what he's saying is, the Holy Spirit is here and you keep resisting him. The Holy Spirit is here convicting you, and you keep resisting. You keep putting on the mute button to him. He's prodding you toward repentance. That's what he does. He convicts you. He prods you to repent. That's his role. And they kept hardening their necks. They kept hardening themselves. In Genesis chapter 3, before the flood, God says, my spirit will not strive with man forever. That's what the spirit does. He convicts. It's his convicting work. And then he said in Genesis, he said it will start, it will stop, then judgment will come. That's Genesis 6. In Zechariah 12, 10, listen to this. You don't have to turn to all these verses, but you can write this one down. I am going to have you turn to John 16 in a moment, but in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, in the last days, he says, I'm going to pour out the spirit of grace on Jerusalem, on Israel, and they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn. They will feel guilt about what they have done. They will feel convicted about what they have done to their Messiah. And it will bring about repentance, by the way. But the point is, that convicting work precedes that repentance. That convicting work precedes that regeneration. That convicting work is the the first work of the Spirit of God in our lives. Convicting. They're going to weep and they're going to cry out and bitterly weeping over their Messiah. Turn to John 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, verse 7 of John 16. Jesus is leaving. Keep this in mind. Jesus is leaving. This is that upper room discourse. Jesus is leaving to go to the cross. He will die. Go to heaven. He's going to say, I will go prepare a place for you. All of that. He tells them all of that in John 14, 15, and 16. He says, but I tell you the truth, verse 7, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Just notice in verse 8, he will convict the world. This is interesting. Peter, you might be preaching in Rome. Thomas might be preaching in India. Bartholomew might be preaching in North Africa. But the Spirit will be in all those places doing his convicting work. You see that? Jesus is local. It's to your advantage that I go. I'm localized. But when I go, I will send the Spirit and he will convict the world. Of sin. That's what the Spirit is doing today. Convicting, His convicting work is going on in the world today. He's omnipresent. And Jesus says, I'll be with you through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The worst sin is do not believe in me. He's concerning sin because they do not believe in me. He's convicting people. The Spirit is convicting people. Remember, he's convicting people so he can make much of Christ to them, right? They can see their sin and see their need for Christ. This is a preceding work of the Spirit so people will understand why they need Jesus. There's no convicting of the Holy Spirit. People don't know what you're talking about. Be saved. What are you talking about?
What he does, folks, and I believe this is how it happens, I believe he activates your conscience. You've got a conscience. Romans says everybody's got a conscience. Everybody is born with a conscience. And before you come to Christ, it's a very effective tool. It's your warning system. It, it, it tells you right and wrong. Whatever you've determined is the standard you live by, it, it, it warns you when you step over the boundary of that. It does warn you somewhat of the moral law of God. It says, do not steal, but you just keep on stealing anyway. You know, you, you keep lying anyway, but it, t- it warns you about that. Something happens. Your conscience does something to condemn you when those things happen. You can turn it off. That's the thing. People get a seared conscience. They, f- they turn off the mute. They put it on mute all the time, and they don't listen to it. But the Spirit of God, I think that's what he works through is our conscience, and he, he activates our conscience. He activates our conscience and energizes our conscience. And, and um, I could get away with it before, but now I feel really bad about it. That's the convicting work of the Spirit. I, I had pushed that down for so long, now I feel bad that I do that. That's wrong that I do that. And so he activates that and and keeps coming back at me and convicting me of that is that it's wrong, that it's sin. He does that in you. He does that in the whole world. And you can't stop that voice. It's his convicting voice. For for, for believers, he's the comforter. But for unbelievers, you know what? He's discomfort, right? He's discomfort. When you, have, when you have pain, you go to the doctor. And that's what the Spirit is doing. He's causing us pain to drive us to the great physician to find healing. And I, and I say to you, this is the preceding work of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to believe, you've got to see the reason to believe. If you're going to believe, you've got to see the reason why. Because your sin. It, 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 without this, it's like the gospel is alien to us. If I have no conviction of my sin, I, I really don't understand the why of the gospel. Because the gospel's about my sin. The gospel's about Jesus dying for my sin because I'm separated from God by my sin. And if I don't understand the sin problem that I have, I really don't care much about a solution. And Jesus is the solution for sin. And that's why this is a message for the whole world, because the whole world sins. And the convicting work of the Spirit is to show that to people that they might believe that Christ might be valued in their lives, in their minds, in their hearts. I, I'm guilty before God, and I need forgiveness before God. And so that's the, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's how he began in your life. And that's how he begins in the life of a believer. Because what he wants to bring about, and we'll see this next time, is he wants to bring about regeneration. But before there can be that, I believe there's this working of conviction of sin and regeneration all working at the same time as I see my need for Christ as a solution to my sin problem. Well, I've got three more. Regeneration and I want to talk about the being baptized in the Spirit. I want to show you from Mark next time. And then I want to talk about being indwelt by the Holy Spirit next time we talk about this. So we've got some other things to say. This is important, important doctrine for us, folks. Don't think, well, I've heard these things before. No, you haven't. I don't believe that. You haven't heard it all in one big picture here where you get the, you get the, whole, you get the whole understanding of how God, because that's what I'm trying to do, is take you through the whole thing and show you biblically how God unfolds this person of the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, 
for us. And I will take you into sanctification. And don't you see the big picture of that and how the Spirit is the one that empowers us in our being conformed to the image of Christ. That's what I want us to see as we go through this. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth, God. May we, not, may, not minim, may we not minimize the importance of this study. May we see the importance, God, of understanding our, our worship is affected by how we view the Trinity, how we view you. God, may we see the importance, Father, of how the Spirit works in us and then dwells us and, and, and changes and conforms us to the image of Christ. We love you and praise you for this time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.